agree with me? Somebody has wronged you, or maybe you've wronged somebody else. And what happens is that unforgiveness creeps in and it owns you, it shapes you. And if we're going to live in community, if we're going to believe God for more fellowship and for more discipleship, we have got to be people that know how to forgive. It's a skill of discipleship. And it, it, when you boil it down, a disciple, excuse me, of Christ knows how to forgive. And so this, this uh, month I've been praying, God, we invite you into our pain, into the bitterness or the rage, the revenge, the anger. We invite God into the emotional conflict that we struggle with and we want to learn to forgive. And what happens, it sets people free. It will set you free. And so our goal, I want to just uh, let you know up front, is that we would collectively and individually experience freedom. You know, a few weeks back, maybe a couple months ago now, uh, Mary Hardy, uh, was, who was keep playing the keys this morning, she came up to me after a service and she said, Pastor, I just sensed in my spirit that there's a spirit of offense in the church. And I said, really? And I said, well, I kind of felt something too and couldn't really put my finger on it. And I started to examine my own heart and my own life. And I realized that there was some offense that I was holding against a few people. And there were some people in my life that when I prayed about it, the Lord revealed that I, there was a high probability that I had offended them. Now, at that point, I'm like, okay, Lord, what do I do? Well, I got on my knees and I prayed and the Lord directed me to pick up the phone. I had a meeting with one family and then, and then uh, I picked up the phone and started saying, hey, have I offended you in any way? Or, hey, when I said this, was that offensive to you because my heart was not to offend? And I'll tell you what happened in my life. This is just a few months ago, a couple months ago. There was a spirit of freedom that came over me and there was a weight that was lifted and there was joy in my heart where the, that Sunday and that couple weeks before there was a heaviness that I couldn't even understand and it was unforgiveness had crept in and so again this this month we're going to talk about forgiveness and we're going to challenge each other to to kind of peel away layers in our lives and ask God to do miracles in our hearts and in our relationship and so that's where we're headed are you with me amen, amen. well let's start by uh, looking at what forgiveness is not forgiveness is not first of all the same as condoning someone's behavior or condoning something someone has said Forgiveness is not pretending that it, whatever it was, was not seriously wrong. Forgiveness doesn't say, well, it's okay, the abuse or the hurt or the things that were said, the situations that we're facing, or that I was taken advantage of, I'm going to forgive, and now it's okay. Absolutely not. That's, that's for sure. Forgiveness is not condoning. You tracking with me so far? The second thing is that forgiveness is not the same as forgetting. Only God forgives and forgets. It says in the word of God that he forgets and he takes our sin as far as the east is from the west. But how many have heard, oh, you just need to forgive and forget? I don't see that in scripture. There are times that we need to remember. If you've been lied to a dozen times, when you deal with that person, you need to remember that they are a liar. Or if you've been cheated in the past, remember some of those things. Or if you've been stole, you know, th things taken from you, you don't just leave your doors open. You lock the doors. You remember uh, some of those things. And so forgiveness is not the same as forgetting. The third thing that forgiveness is not, it doesn't mean that there's always a chance for reconciliation. Now, in the best case scenarios, that's the goal. But sometimes it would be dangerous for reconciliation to happen. It may, you may not be able to ever be in the same room as the person that has hurt you or, or, or done something dangerous for you or for your kids. There are toxic people in this world and we have to protect our kids or protect ourselves at times. Things may never go back to the way they were, but you can still forgive. 
and God wants us to forgive. Forgiveness is different from justice and consequences as well. You may forgive someone, but they may still need to pay. What's right in the circumstances that you're facing? Is it a court order to follow through in that way? to call the authorities, to get a restraining order. Certainly there are times in our lives where that would be appropriate. Let's bring it to home. If you have kids and and, uh, when my kids disobey and uh, and I want to forgive them for something that they've said or they've done, that doesn't mean that they don't still need a good spank or that they would be grounded or that we would take away privileges because forgiveness is different from consequences. I put in my notes here that, you know, there may be a day where someone wants to to court my daughter, be around my daughter, and I may say, hey, you are never allowed with my daughter again. And I'm just practicing because Reagan's turning 13 this week. And uh, so I got to get those words, and I want to be the tough dad that loves to. (laughs) And uh, it's fun. We're going to go out this weekend and talk a little bit about our future. But listen, in, in, uh, in business, there may be a time where, or, or uh, wherever you are, where you would say, boy, I'm never going to be a partner again with this person. There's consequences. Yes, you forgive, but it's different from justice and consequences. And so those are some things that are important for us to realize. Now, forgiveness is, I want you to know, it's personal. And in every case, it's personal. You can't say, oh, I'm mad at the world, or I'm mad at the government, or I'm mad at the school, or the church, or I'm mad at this business or that business. Because forgiveness is personal. You cannot be angry or hurt or bitter with an organization, with a group, with a business. You cannot be angry at the church. It's the people in the church, or it's the people at the school, or with the government. It's the people that you are uh, mad at, or angry with, or bitter to. Forgiveness is personal. And forgiveness is also a process, and I know that, and I've seen that, that if you've been hurt for 10 or 20 or 30 years, you've lived in it, it's it's formed you, and maybe you've even passed it on to your kids, that there's this, this sense of unforgiveness, deep hurt and pain and anger. And oftentimes what happens, it's those that are closest to you, an employer or a teacher or a pastor, or a parent, or a son or daughter, or certainly a spouse that can cause, there can be unforgiveness and that it's a process to move beyond that hurt, to move beyond that pain and to allow God to move in your heart to a place where you can consider your heart and life to be free. I said at the beginning that our goal is that we would experience God's freedom. And we do experience that, but sometimes it's a process. Maybe a step or two in the right direction over these next couple weeks is is the progress that you will be able to make. Maybe you'll stop planning the demise, the the death of so-and-so. Or maybe the Lord would put in your heart to to be able to write a note and say, man, uh, have I hurt you? Or in this circumstance, I know I hurt you. I'm sorry. Maybe the, the process will begin where you can pick up the phone like I did and you clear the air and you have clean accounts. And I'm telling you, it is freeing and God wants to do it in your heart. He's doing it in mine, in, our, in this church. We want to be people that are free indeed. So where does forgiveness begin? I want you to turn with me to Judges chapter 15. And if I had to put a title on today's message, the message would be called Drop the Jawbone. And you'll see what I'm talking about here in just a second. Um, Judges 15 is interesting. It's a story of revenge. And it's not the only story in Scripture. In fact, there are multiple, multiple Scriptures and stories throughout the Old Testament and New where there's a struggle of revenge. And what's interesting is in 2 Samuel chapter 3, we see it with Abner and Joab. In 1 King chapter 2, with David and Saul. In Esther, if you know the story, Haman and Mordecai struggled with, with uh, revenge. 
Jezebel had revenge toward Elijah, Ahab towards Michna, uh, the Philistines with the Israelites over and over. And in the New Testament, it's interesting, as you study John the Baptist, does anybody know who was uh, opposing him? Does anybody have an idea? It's interesting, as a study in this, Herodias was, was so much against John the Baptist, and there was so much revenge that John the Baptist's head ended up on a platter. Death was resulted from this bitterness and rage and revenge. The Nazarenes had, took revenge towards Christ, the Sanhedrin toward the apostles, the Jews with Paul. And it's interesting, even in Jesus' ministry, as he's walking in his disciples, they struggled with the idea of getting even or revenge. In Luke chapter 9, verse verse 54. James and John, they're walking along the road and the, the apostles and Jesus are really experiencing some struggle with the Samaritans and they're, they're, ha- they're having all this opposition. And James and John say, Jesus, can't we just call down fire from heaven? And Jesus says, no, we're going to handle it a little different. And they wanted revenge. But Jesus says, no, there's a better way. Now, revenge, it can be active where you set out to say something and you know it's vengeful or you, you set out to do something that you know is going to hurt or wound and it's very intentional. It can be active or perhaps your revenge, and maybe in your life, it's more passive. You may not be able to put your finger on it right away, but it's the cold shoulder, the silent treatment. It can be subtle it, where you... Treat them as if they don't exist. You start avoiding someone. Or you wait for someone on the side. And instead of you attacking them, doing the, uh, the aggression, you just wait for someone else to wound them, and you secretly are on the side smiling, saying, yeah, get them. You know what I'm saying? It can be passive or active. And in Judges 15, the story here is anything but Passive. And let's look at this verse, these few verses, and let's learn about revenge. It's a story of Samson and the Philistines, and listen to what it says. It says, later on uh, at the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. Guys, when you go to visit your wife, just follow Samson's clue. Just take a goat. You know things are going to be good. He said, I'm going to visit my wife's room. So he's hoping it gets romantic, right? He'd bring a goat. I don't know. That's uh, not my idea of romance, but that's what it is. But her father would not let him go in. I was so sure that you thoroughly hated her that I gave her to your friend. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? What? Take her instead? Now, I said for service, this is kind of like a cross between Jerry Springer and Dr. Ruth at this point. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's what a messed up story. And Samson said to the father-in-law, uh, this time I, will, I have the right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and he caught 300 foxes like any other man would do. And he tied the tails to tie a tail to tail in pairs. He fastened torches to every one of them, lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks in the standing grain together with the vineyards and the olive groves. Everyone say round one. When the Philistines asked, who did this? They were told, Samson, the Timnite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his friend. So the Philistines went out and burned up, or burned her and her father to death. Listen, it started off with a man and his goat and a father-in-law, and now two people are dead. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. Samson said, Since you've acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you, or on them, on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in the cave at the Rock of Edom. Everyone say, round two. And the story goes on. We have come here to take Samson prisoner, they asked. Whoops, I'm sorry. The Philistines went up to ca- and camped in, the Phil- in Judah, spreading out near Le- Lehi. The men of Judah asked, Why have you come to fight us? We have come here to take Samson prisoner, they asked, to do to him as he did to us. 
Now look at verse 3, or verse 11. Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? Why or what have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. What started with one man, his goat, and the father-in-law, now 3,000 people are involved. He said, I only did to them what they did to me. And they said to him, we've come to tie you up and to hand you over to the Philistines. And Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him from the rock. And as they approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson in power. The ropes in his arm became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down. He killed a thousand men. Then Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. Anyone else's version say something different? I'm not sure. But uh, with a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. Everyone say round three. three. See, what happens, and in this story, we start off with a father-in-law, and then Samson gets mad. He gets 300 fox together, and he burns up their fields. And as you study that in the original language, there's massive damage done to the livelihood of the Philistines. And it's important to note that. It's also, uh, many commentators believe that this story, that there is, it's like my God against your God in that story. That's why he burned up their fields because they, they worshiped the gods that provided the crops, the sun and the moon, the rain and all those things. It moved on and two people were killed. Then Samson retaliates and kills many. doesn't say how many, but he kills many. Then 3,000 people are involved and the end result are that thousands of people died because of this by a jawbone. What's interesting about this story and the reason I use this particular story is because revenge always has an inflammatory nature. One guy and a goat leads to a thousand people dying. Revenge always escalates back and forth, back and forth. And we see it perfectly in this story. And maybe you can uh, find yourself in this story saying, boy, this is so true. Throughout the Bible, there's other stories that, that illustrate very similar things. And even in great literature, How many of you remember studying Shakespeare uh, when you were a kid or maybe in college? What was the great story of revenge? The the boy and the girl, Romeo and Juliet. And there's these two families, the Montagues and the Capulets. And Romeo and Juliet, they just wanted to be together. They didn't understand all the family dynamics for hundreds of years. But they knew that it started somewhere. And what happened, it probably started small. And it always, always grow. Do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of that game that I played when I was little, Pong. You remember the awesome video game? Bong, 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 right? Back and forth. And that's what, this, that's what happened in Romeo and Juliet. That's what happened in this story of Samson. That's what happened in my life at different times. You know, we're in this, the election season. And someone after service said, boy, one of the candidates just used that word revenge. And they just go back and forth, back and forth. The previous election, it was interesting, as I was studying this, I I ran across a story. Remember Sarah Sarah Palin and uh, Tina Fey was impersonating her, had a likeness, uh, looked a little bit like her, and that that distinct voice. So Tina Fey just ran that. I mean, it was pretty pretty comical, I guess. And... uh, but Tina Fey, uh, they, they don't, not only went back and forth, Sarah Palin would say a few things and Tina Fey would say some things, and then it gets out on the internet. And boy, the bloggers, they just go, have, go to town and they're just ripping into Tina Fey. Well, as I was reading about this story, Tina Fey is accepting an award. You might remember this. And uh, she's accepting her, in her acceptance speech, she picks up a jawbone and starts swinging at Sarah Palin in front of uh, you know, millions of people with a TV audience, but 
probably a couple thousand people in the stadium. She starts swinging and taking shots at, at uh, Sarah Palin and to all those people that had said some negative things. And she said, you know, it's, it wasn't appropriate. I was going to show up, but it wouldn't fit for the morning. But, uh, but I said, as I was listening to it, I found it online. She starts saying things like, you know, and now for all those bloggers that said this and this, and uh, let me tell you what I think. And it's like she's got this jawbone. It just starts swinging at people. And what happens? The people just erupt. And I, even when I'm listening to it, I'm like, yeah, get them. <laughs> because there's a part of us that likes revenge. In all of us, we like it. And we play that game. Pong, bong, pong. And we play different versions. The 2.0 version, the 3.0, the 4.0. We play marriage pong. Revenge, revenge, revenge. Family pong. Little schoolgirl pong. <laughs> Business pong. And we carry their jawbones. And we just start swinging when someone hurts us. We send it back. Little zingers here and there. Where does forgiveness begin? It begins when we learn to drop the jawbone, when we put down the jawbone. And Scripture speaks to this in a couple different areas. I want to uh, highlight this morning. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 17. This is an interesting passage here. G uh, uh, Paul is writing to the Romans, and uh, it's in a section he's talking about love. He says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, devote yourself to brotherly love, he says. He says, be joyful, um, rejoice with each other, live in harmony with one another, verse 16. But look what verse 17 says. He says to the Roman church, he says to us, he says, do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. In verse 21, it says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How many know that's a, quite a different picture than revenge? Seeking to get even. We are to bless people. We're to leave it up for God to cause the wrath, to bring wrath upon the circumstances. We saw Jesus in uh, 1 Peter, as we look at Jesus' example, Jesus had suffered all kinds of things in uh, verse 23 of uh, second, or 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, He committed no sin, no deceit was found on his mouth. And look at verse 23. It says, When they hurled their insults at him, what did Jesus do? Did he just give it right back? Pong, pong, no. It says he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He allowed God to bring the wrath, to let God do his fighting for him. He turned them over to his heavenly Father, and we can do the same thing. One more verse in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, most famous uh, message ever. We see that Jesus, he redefines the law of the Old Testament. And in uh, verse 43, he says, You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And everyone say, yes, okay. But Jesus says, no, I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Listen. We are to love and to pray for those that have hurt us, those that have caused deep pain. And we've talked about this before. When you begin to pray for someone that has hurt you, that has wounded you, what happens to your heart for them? It starts to grow. You begin to see them in a different light, perhaps more like what Jesus would see. The alternative to revenge is to forgive, to put the jawbone down. 
Revenge says, I don't like the way, you do it, that you, the way you're doing your job, God. I will be justice. I will be God's wrath. I can do it better. And because of that, we justify all kinds of evil and all kinds of nasty things. But the goal is not to live in revenge, guys. The goal is to live in freedom, to release people, to set other people free. And when we set other people free, it frees ourselves. We want to invite God into the pain, into the hurt, into the bitterness. Not to take revenge, not to play the silly game of Pong back and forth, but instead learn what Scripture says to bless them, to pray for them, and let God avenge. Today we all have stories. If we took the time, we could all think of things in our lives, different various levels, things that we've had to struggle with forgiveness or unforgiveness, various needs of forgiveness. And maybe today you've, you've been beyond some of that, but it's very possible that there are many of us today that are right in the thick of it. Today, my prayer is that you would start a process of forgiveness. Healing is available. To leave it at the altar, to set someone free, to drop the jawbone. Because what happens, it, the result is that you become free as well. I don't know what you're facing. I'm not sure what kind of pain or what kind of things that you are angry about. You could be angry at God this morning. And you know what God wants more than anything? He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to show you a different light of why things have happened the way they've happened, why the divorce happened, or why the child was, was uh, struck with sickness. God wants to come in and to heal. One of our friends, Elizabeth Efkin, she knew we were talking about forgiveness, and um, she said, she came up, or her husband actually said, boy, Elizabeth's got a great story about forgiveness. When I heard it, I said, Elizabeth, would you be willing to share? Give us a little glimpse of, the, of a process that God took you through. And she said, absolutely. So without further ado, why don't you share your story of forgiveness? Well, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, this month is National Adoption Month. And um, 17 years ago last week, I gave up my firstborn son for adoption. And um, I was 19 years old. And um, I was in college at Calvin in Grand Rapids. And my folks lived in Chicago. And um, when God spoke to me and told me not to get an abortion, I made the difficult phone call of calling my family and telling them that I was pregnant. And that was going to be really difficult because they had worked so hard for me to go to college. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the original plan was that I was going to come home after school got out in, at the end of May and be at home for having the baby. And um, I had planned on giving the baby up for adoption. And come May, two weeks before my lease ran out, my folks called me up and, and they said, we've made a decision and we've decided um, that you can't come home. And I was like, mm. what? I'm my lease runs out in two weeks. Where am I going to go? I have nowhere to live. And, hmm. and they were like, I don't know, but we've decided we're not going to tell anybody and, um, and you can't come here. And so I was just devastated mm -hmm. and felt very uh, abandoned um, and hopeless. Um, Bethany Christian Services offered me a place to live with a family and I um, actually moved in with them and they took pregnant girls into their home and um, it turned out to be a huge blessing. They're still f good friends of ours today. Mm -hmm. And um, anyways, through my whole pregnancy, like I said, I plan on giving the baby up for adoption. And um, I met my husband, Eric, while I was pregnant for my son. I was about six months, five months pregnant when I met Eric. And um, anyway, I, I had the baby, and you don't realize the love that you have for a child until it's th physically there, sure. and you're holding it. And I changed my mind, and I wanted to keep him. Hmm. And I had to figure out how. How am I going to do this? You know. And so I'm going to the welfare office, trying to find out how much help hmm. they can give me. I'm 
trying to figure out, you know, where I can get help and where I'm going to live and how I'm going to do all this. And, and my folks called me up, my mom, and she said, um, you know, you can't, you know, when they found out I was having second thoughts, she said, you can't bring this baby home, so don't even go there in your thoughts. And I was like, thank you for reaffirming, you know, my abandonedness. Mm-hmm. But, and then a couple days later, she called me and said, and we're going to take your car away. And I was like, what? Because that was, you know, you need a car mm-hmm. to get to work sure. or whatever. And so I was really feeling hopeless and forced into having no other choice but um, give this baby up for adoption. And that feeling is just a horrible, horrible feeling inside to be forced into doing something that you don't feel right doing. Mm -hmm. God came in, he he gave me perfect peace, and I knew that it was the right thing. You know, he he paved a way for me to have a choice, and in the end, I decided that adoption was going to be for me. And um, my relationship with my parents had suffered from that. There was a fakeness when we were together. There was, you know, kind of a Let's just, my parents are good at pretending mm-hmm. that nothing is wrong. Sure. And I kind of went along with that, but it was eating me in my spirit and my soul. Mm. And it was affecting my relationship with God from, from growing or having um, experiences, spiritual experiences that I might otherwise been able to be open to. And I made the choice, you know, after I, we were, Eric and I were married, I don't know, maybe a year passed, and I just said, I can't live like this mm. anymore. Yeah. It's, it's eating me alive, it's making me miserable, and, and I, I can't do this. And I made a decision because I feel like forgiveness is a choice. And I just said, God, I forgive my, my family. And I choose to believe that they thought that they were doing what was best for me at the time. And it was very difficult to make that decision because, as I said earlier, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I feel like forgiving people today. (laughs) So anyway, I I made the decision. I didn't go and call my parents and say, I just want you to know I forgive you. It was something that I just did privately, personally, and and a freedom came over me and... I have an awesome relationship with my parents today. Thank you. And I do believe that they thought that they were doing what was best for me. But, you know, forgiveness is a choice. Yes. And you, you got to make that decision to experience the freedom. Yeah. Awesome. Let's thank Elizabeth for sharing that. Yeah. Now, I asked her to share that because it's so personal many times And it's oftentimes the people that are closest to us that hurt us the most. And whether it was good intentioned or not, it took a lot for Elizabeth and Eric to say, you know what, we're going to live in freedom. We're going to release them, and we're going to be free as well. And I love that you guys are uh, back together and, and able to experience all kinds of goodness. This morning, you may be here this morning, and need to break the cycle of unforgiveness in your life, in your family's life. Maybe you've walked with it. Maybe that's the only thing you've ever known was to carry a jawbone. And when someone gives it to you, you give it right back. Maybe there's situations where you have been excusing wrong, revenge, because of what someone has done, whether it's passive or active. Maybe there's a situation where you need to turn it over to a heavenly Father that loves you to entrust those things to God. See, my hope is that this morning we will begin a process together to see God heal us from unforgiveness and to be able to reveal some areas where we have kind of been walking in unforgiveness, maybe without even knowing when Mary came to me, Mary Hardy, and said, boy, I, I just sense a, a, a spirit of offense, uh, I could have been like, yeah, there's probably people that are really, you know, uh, offended at someone and just holding on to all kinds of things. Instead, I said, Lord, show me first. 
I'm responsible for this church. And you know what? You're responsible for your family and in your circumstances. And if there is unforgiveness, I want to encourage you to start that process to take a, one step at a time and let God to say, you know what? I'm not going to carry this one any longer. Not one more day. And what happens when we start that process, there's a weight that is lifted that is promised for us. When we invite uh, God in to the pain, to the abuse, to the neglect, to whatever has been wrong. And you know what? I would just want to say before we go to prayer here in just a second, that it may be that God can, uh, we're going to bring some people to the altar if, if the Lord leads you in that way to pray and we're going to end in our service in that way. I believe that God can do in an instant at the altar what may take years to, to happen uh, in a counseling office or on your own efforts. I understand that. But there may be something that's happened in your life that is so deep or so painful or so mysterious that you can't even put your finger on it that you would need some professional help. And there is no shame in that. And I would just want to encourage you that as, as you begin to look at your life and say, God, where is it in my life? Is there any area that I've been holding on to things that I need to release that you may need to, to move and uh, to look for a good family uh, Christian counselor to start that healing process to keep it moving? God wants to move in our hearts. He wants to move in my life. I know it. And he wants to move in yours as well. And this morning, as we come to a close, I, I understand that, that it's personal, that there's this process, that it's painful. It's even hard to admit. You, would, you, you may not even want to share it with anyone, some of the pain that you've kind of been hanging on to. But I just want to encourage you that whether it's here or in the quiet of your own room, to begin to surrender to a heavenly father and say, God, help me in this process. And trust God to bring you along. And I believe that God will do just that. Amen? Amen. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. This morning, it's possible that you are here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. If you were to die today, you don't know where you'd spend your eternity. Maybe at one time you've served God or you've trusted in God, but today you're far, far away. This morning, we want to give you an opportunity to surrender your heart to Jesus. The great thing about our Heavenly Father is He is quick to forgive. He doesn't hold it against us. There's nothing that separates us from the love of our Father, our Heavenly Father. And that may be different than your circumstances where you've grown up or where, what you've experienced on this earth. But our Heavenly Father is so great. He loves you so much. This morning, if you need to get your heart right with the Lord, like six or seven people did last month in October, maybe you need to surrender your life and, and say, Jesus, be the ruler of my life. If that's you today, would you just slip up your hand? I want to pray with you. I'm not going to single you out, but who this morning would say, Pastor Ben, Pastor ben that's me. Pray for me. I need to get my heart right with God. Anyone at all? Just looking around. I'm looking on my right, your left, in the center. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. On my left. Anyone else that's saying, boy, that's me. I need to surrender my life to Jesus. Praise God. This morning, I believe God wants to do a great work, not only in salvation, and we'll pray about that in just a moment. I'm wondering how many here today would be honest as we close our eyes and bow our heads, no one looking around, this is personal. How many would say, Pastor Ben, I need to experience forgiveness in this season of my life? Just lift up your hand. Maybe it's forgiveness in an area at work or at school with friends, with a spouse. Yeah, you can put your hand down. Anyone else saying, yeah, that's me. I need that desperately. Yeah, thank you. See, God, He is a loving God. He's not going to force us to do anything, but He does encourage us. And what I'd like to do this morning is to end in a little different fashion. I'm going to ask, first of all, that everyone would stand, and we're going to do something together as a body of, of believers. 
I'm going to ask that you stand, and then I'm going to ask that everyone here would slip out from where you are. And I just want you to come to the altar this morning. We didn't do this first service, but I just sensed in, uh, in the, as God is moving, would you just move and slip out and just come forward, just make your way up to the front. We're not going to single anybody out, but I believe that God wants to move in our lives And uh, many, many of you raised your hand saying, boy, I need to experience forgiveness in this way. And what we're going to do is we're going to just spend a couple minutes surrendering to our Heavenly Father, saying, God, come into my life and I release this person or I release myself from the pain or from what I've done. We can forgive God in these moments and say, God, I entrust my life to you. Or we can ask God to forgive us of our sins and create a relationship with him. Whatever the case might be, would you in the next, these next few moments, and Josh, you can start um, that, uh, that song for us. That'd be great. Um, let's just surrender our hearts to the Lord and ask him to fill us up, all right? Hallelujah. Praise your name. Lord, we just ask right now in these next few moments, God, no matter what we're facing, God, that we would surrender to you, that we would hear your voice clearly, that we would release others, we would free them, and that we would be free ourselves. We ask it for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord.